two threats in the Mediterranean, NATO's role and the defense cooperation in Europe. That was the title that Stefania asked me to perform today. Quite interesting because, and I'm really happy because this effort of engagement is sponsorized by NATO, by the NATO engagement uh, program to spread the culture of defense among universities. So I'm really, really, it's also perfectly, I mean, politically correct today to have also the NATO in our title and to, to give some hints about these ideas of threats, Mediterranean and defense cooperation. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with NATO. NATO is an old organization and was a symbol of what we can call the collective defense under uh, the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War has been for, for a long time a paradigm associated to our security. So our collective security was shaped during the Cold War with NATO. Uh, quite simply, it was an alliance between the US and the Western European countries facing the USSR and the Eastern uh, European countries, uh, the so-called uh, Warsaw Pact. During the Cold War, what is interesting is that the Mediterranean did exist in this strategic context. But the Mediterranean was conceived as a strategic dimension of the threat. It was the so-called southern flank uh, of the NATO, meaning that there was a fear that from the Mediterranean could come some threats from the Warsaw Pact, from USSR and its allies, in an attack towards Europe. What did it mean? I mean, that, the next, if, you, if you read the old books, and some old, of the old books have been written by some of the, my colleagues from EI, I mean, it's called Fianco Sud della Nato, but you can also, I mean, uh, there is a very interesting book, Rischio a Sud from uh, Carlo Maria Santoro. I mean, there was a long, uh, uh, Italian uh, have produced in very interesting thinkings about that. If you read all these books, you see that at that time, the Warsaw Pact, meaning USSR and its allied, uh, was perceived as a threat which could have attacked directly uh, Europe. It could have attacked Europe from the north with tanks, planes, and everything, but it could have attacked it also from the south with you know, an air, air, air force and, uh, and navy capabilities, atta attacking also Italy, and uh, uh, obviously attacking Italy to weaken uh, the NATO alliance as a war. It was a global war plan. And there was also a fear that in Italy you would have some, I would say, friendly uh, partisan-like, um, I mean, friendly to communism, partisan-like movement, ready to take the, the, the weapons and to, um, to, to, to create a civil war inside Italy. Another big concept at that time was that Italy was fearing that from former Yugoslavia there, was, there should be some conventional attack on the Gorizia border, you know, with tanks and, and planes and everything. So that's, that sounds today completely old, I'm sure, and very odd too, very strange what I'm telling you. But that was the history going on for 40 years, you know, and NATO was deployed, was ready, was trained to face this kind of plans, and it has also a nuclear uh, dimension. So there was tactical nuclear, strategical nuclear, conventional, I mean, all this. And the, at that time, the Mediterranean was, you know, through the, the Black Sea and then the Mediterranean, you had the perception of a, of a direct threat potentially coming from the USSR also with allies and bases in the, in the Mediterranean. And Syria, and we, I will come back today to, to Syria, but Syria at that time was a point where uh, USSR could, uh, I would say, have some logistical facilities and some bases to, 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 to expand and to launch an attack in the Mediterranean. Um, at the end of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, it's, when the, when the USSR completely blew up. This scenario, this confrontation scenario disappeared. 
Russia came out completely diminished from the blow up of, of the former USSR. And from the early 90s to the 2010s, so from 30 years, we lived without a direct threat. NATO was still into place, but we didn't have a direct threat anymore. We couldn't think of someone really attacking us. So what happened? During this period, from 1990s to 2010, uh, 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 several indirect threats were put on the agenda as a threat. The main concern was destabilization and conflicts in neighborhood areas. And obviously, we have here to recall the examples of Balkans, you know, specifically former Yugoslavia, but also Albany in, in the 1990s. So, no direct, real threat anymore. I mean, after the, the end of the Cold War, we don't have a real threat. We don't have a real enemy supposed to be able or to will to attack us in a military way. But then pops up some problems of indirect threats. I mean, Balkans and the, the blow up of Yugoslavia was you know, a big concern also for the destabilization that it could have provoked and that it has provoked uh, just on the other side of the border of Italy. And, and, and you can multiply those kind of things. So NATO was born as a collective defense organization to fight, eventually, to deter and to fight an enemy. Uh, after losing its main, uh, its main goal, its main raison d'etre, if I can use for once a French word, we can observe two trends. NATO did maintain a collective defense capability in a, what I would call the, a Cold War style. So NATO maintained its capability, strategic, uh, for resi uh, in, a, in a resilience vision, because you never know. And also because military organization tends to be really conservative. They have learned for decades to do something. It's not because as a scenario has changed that they are going to evolve. This is perceived as a very bad thing by a lot of people. They say, oh, they always do the thing. They have these airplanes that are completely useful because they are too sophisticated, and you don't have an enemy to fight them, blah, blah, blah. But maybe one day you think, oh, well, it, has been, it wasn't so bad that we kept this, this useless thing because they can turn useful again, because you never know what's going to happen. So it maintained this thing. But then NATO has to reinvent itself. Also, for political accountability reason. What is political accountability? It's people, uh, say, uh, governments, parliaments, who say to NATO, OK, we are in NATO, but uh, once you had the, you had the bad uh, USSR, now we have Russian, which is weak. So it's not an enemy anymore. You are useless. So NATO has to prove to be useful. And this is why NATO, after the Cold War, has done two things. Security cooperation enlargement, and NATO has uh, taken on board several countries, and to create somehow and to expand a safety belt around NATO, integrating countries, but also uh, establishing agreements and relationship with another belt of countries. This also is, is, is also linked to the, it's parallel to what, to the European Union uh, enlargement. Also because NATO, NATO membership uh, requires a certain level of democracy, a democratic control on the military spending and the decision. I mean, so it, it, it was part of a movement also of countries uh, willing to integrate what I would call the European democratic model. But uh, this, is security, this security cooperation task is really important, but maybe the most uh, important one has been crisis management. What do we call when we speak about crisis management for NATO? It's very simple. It's the, the fact that not NATO has uh, supported what we call out-of-area missions 
has deployed troops in some very specific contexts like Kosovo, Afghanistan, or Libya, 2011. So for the first time, again, it's paradoxical, for the first time, NATO, NATO has been put into action. After the, during the Cold War, NATO never really worked, and we are quite happy because there was no war. So NATO was very active, but it was de deterrence and training. After, after the Cold War, this main, uh, this main goal disappeared, and then we have NATO contributing to this crisis management outside the European territory with capabilities, coordinations, uh, with a different set of, of things. And that's, that's quite in, important, and this trend is still going on. I mean, the NATO is still, is still present in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, for example. So those were the two, um, the two paradigms. But in recent times, we have seen something else happening. I mean, Georgia, what I would call Georgia war in 2008, and Ukraine in 2014, and I would say also Syria in 2015 and 2016, have re reset the agenda. Why? Because Russia is coming back, or is popping up, as uh, able and willing to use the military force to pursue its political goal. Uh, and the use of the military force in, on, on the European soil, Georgia or on the European border, Georgia and then Ukraine, is perceived by a large number of members of NATO as a collective security issue. Specifically for the, the member who, were, who are the most sensitive now to Russia threat, obviously Poland, the Baltic states, uh, Romania, Hungary, I mean the former um, the former countries who were member of the US uh, of the Warsaw Pact and who don't, who don't who do not want at all to come back to this kind of world they have escaped from. And this so the use of force by Russia has set again a, a new I would say a new paradigm. Um, also, Syria, which is a bit different, it's not on the European soil, but Syria also is a, a, a clear, um, I mean, a very interesting case where Russia is using its military power uh, to pursue a military goal, to, 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 to sustain and ally, I mean, the, the Bashar al-Assad regime, to keep him alive, but also to, to, to show to the, to the international community that it has a political weight, that he can play a game, and that's what happened in Syria, uh, with also an interesting deployment of military force on the ground. And I will come back to that. So uh, again, and this has been made also in a quite sensitive way with NATO because Syria is on the border of Turkey, and Turkey is an important NATO member. And there, have, there has been some kind of, I mean, shaky episodes with Russian planes getting into Turkey airspace, and it's not completely clear what happened, and then being shot. Uh, this has, has uh, I mean, has been clearly a problem, and still is, and is a NATO problem also. So, you see, all these things are happening, all this Russian activism is happening on what we could call the NATO border. So we are back somehow to collective security hypothesis. So, uh, what happened recently, and I'm gonna come back to 
some of the things we, we, we have in this title. In terms of, of NATO and European collective uh, security and defense, uh, what, are, what is the recent evolution and what can we say? Well, uh, NATO, this shift, this NATO shift has been clearly uh, seen in the two last NATO summits, which are Wales in 2014 and Warsaw in 2016. And uh, in, those two, uh, in those two important NATO summits, I mean, th those are the main uh, political reunion uh, for, for NATO intergovernmental decision with defense ministers are taken, uh, if not prime ministers. Uh, collective defense became again the number one issue and crisis management and security cooperation still remain but collective defense has came back as a top priority of the agenda. This thing obviously has produced a, a, a series of measures that those of you who read the international uh, actually uh, international news might have observed meaning that uh, some reinsurance measure have been decided. What do we call reinsurance measure? The fact that some uh, soldiers have been deployed again in Pol Poland and in the Baltic states, meaning that uh, French, Italian, Germans, and so far and so on, soldiers, Americans, have been deployed again in those, in those states. It doesn't, mean that it, it, it doesn't mean that it is an effective uh, an effective number of soldiers uh, able to contrast uh, a, a large scale attack coming from Russia. But it is a very political and symbolic decision. I mean, a small amount of multinational soldiers mean that if you attack those countries, you're going to kill French, Italian, German, or American soldiers too. So if you will to attack those countries, you know that you're going to kill some, some other uh, important NATO member states, which means that you probably, if you attack those countries, you're going to have all the coalition uh, able to reply because you, you, you attack all the target. So that's the kind of reinsurance measure that has been taken again. Uh, also, uh, Russia, since, uh, since in, the, in the year 2000 and 2010, has relaunched uh, its military effort. Let's not forget that the Russian economical weight as a global weight is a bit lower than Italy. So, with all the due respect with, for Italy, I mean, uh, Russia is for sure a power, but a limited power. Okay? And it has some criticalities in its, in its economy. Uh, the, the, the fact that it relies on oil and oil export, the fact that the oil price now are quite low, and so far and so on. Okay. But once we've said that, uh, there, there, there is for sure with the oil revenues, the fact that the Russia had, has some availability in terms of budget and has remodernized is its military capabilities. And this has to be taken, or has been taken by NATO uh, in, in, uh, in uh, launching some efforts to enhance, to, to reshuffle NATO military capabilities. Also, and this is very discussed too, but I'm not going to enter that discussion, uh, NATO has deployed a, ballist, a ballistic missile defense with also a southern flank initiative meaning that there is an hypothesis of interception of Russian ballistic missiles in the Mediterranean. Uh, I, I stop here because if you are interested, we can, we can debate of that, but it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it's another big uh, chapter. And meaning that also the, the US and not only are calling for more investment. Uh, for years, this, this, the fact that the U.S. was saying, oh, you know, you're not investing anymore, you're cutting, you're cutting uh, uh, defense expenses, and you, nobody is reaching the goal that we established, and, and, and so far and so on. Which should be 2% of the GDP invested in defense. Well, uh, these things weren't perceived as important because there was no real threat. 
again, for 30 years, you didn't have any scenarios of really people, military, attacking the European soil. We can find some marginal things. I mean, terrorism is certainly important, but terrorism is terrorism. It's not a war, okay? So, people were agreeing on the, on the global analysis and say, yeah, 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 but at the end, you know, you, every government then will decide that it was bit better maybe to give money to, I don't know, to, uh, to uh, teachers and to uh, healthcare and to uh, trains and to whatever. I mean, any kind of social constituencies in the interns seems, at least in Europe, more important than the, the, the military expenditure. Until a few, now, it's, it's true that from, since two years now, we are observing some, some signs in the contrary. I mean, Germany is slowing, shifting. Germany is coming back. Germany has, Germany is as always a very serious country. And Germany has made the diagnosis that its military, uh, I would say, tool is not working very well. So they are getting back in some more expenditures and new programs and so far and so on. They have they publish a new uh, a new white book on defense. It's still very pacifist as a philosophy, but the the, the fact that Germany which is a very, very, very cautious country on that defense matters. He's speaking about defense again. Is a real, is a real sign. France, since last year, has raised its level of, of military expenditure, also for other reasons, clearly ter terrorism, but also for, for the needs in terms of uh, intervention uh, in uh, the Middle East and in the Sahel. And, uh, and, uh, and Italy has published a, a very interesting white book on, on defense foreseeing also the same goals. Well, until now, this white book hasn't been really translated into, into measures, uh, effective measure action, but nevertheless, the, the idea is there. So there is something shifting slowly, but there is something shifting. Um, what, 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 what can we say about the Mediterranean? Or in a NATO perspective, the southern flank? So there is, uh, coming from the recent NATO summit, we have this reinforcement of the security partnerships with 1,000 countries, like training mission in Iraq and in Jordania. Always, you know, this uh, security approach, this building, uh, the, the building of a new security is something very important for NATO. The idea that you, you cannot really deploy troops but you have to ensure that you have friendly countries with, uh, with troops that are well prepared and uh, well trained and can also be integrated in new operations, ready to operate in those countries that are key. And for sure, Jordania, for example, is a key country. Uh, let's not remember that in 2011, NATO was with the operation Unified Protection. NATO was the framework of the intervention in Libya. And that is, uh, that raises up, that raises a lot of political questions. I mean, the fact that in 2011, um, uh, after uh, a UN Security Council mandate, an, an international operation was decided uh, with some humanitarian goals, uh, which was to protect the populations against uh, some scenario of civil war but on, finished, in a way, by uh, a regime change, uh, putting out, uh, completely uh, wiping out the, the Muammar Gaddafi regime, has, uh, has uh, fostered a lot of critics since. And this, is a way, this, in a way, is not a very good thing for NATO, because uh, NATO was caught into this operation also because some members like Italy didn't want it that uh, the leadership would be uh, French, uh, British, and uh, US. It, it, those three countries were pushing for this operation in 2011. Italy was quite reluctant, did participate, did use the military force, did use its bombers in a very efficient way, but it was made under, until, uh, under the NATO umbrella. 
this also this is a problem because it, it, it wasn't such a success, or at least this operation was a success, but still the, there, is, there are a lot of discussions ongoing now about uh, oh, but we, we should have done this operation, yes or no. I mean, it, it, it's an operation which is very criticized now. Maybe with not so, not, I mean, I, I'm, it's quite easy to criticize when something has happened, but okay. But it's criticized. So it means that it delegitimates NATO now uh, for this kind of operation. It creates something which is not so positive for this, uh, for this crisis uh, management uh, side of NATO. Uh, I know that you are very keen and very expert in immigration. Well, you might know and I'm sure know that the, uh, the NATO is providing support to uh, the so-called SOFIA operation. Uh, Arona for Med Sofia, which is a European uh, operation, is supported by NATO. Uh, NATO once has this kind of support in the agency. It was called Active Endeavor, but now it has been uh, raised up to a more global level for the whole Mediterranean with the so-called Sea Guardian operation. NATO now and NATO fleets, I'm speaking about Navy, are doing intelligence and monitoring uh, for and providing logistical support to uh, European uh, navies involved in uh, Euro NAV4. So uh, NATO has raised up its level of commitment in, 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 uh, in supporting Europe. It's always a bit tricky because NATO is a defense and war organization. And it's, it's not its mandate to, to in, in theoretically, to do something like, uh, you know, monitor and take care and, of immigration, uh, traffic, and so forth. So. But again, there is a strong political push, and NATO now, in the last summit, has raised up its level of cooperation with, with Europe in that sense. Uh, the NATO airplanes, NATO airwalks, you know, the, the radar planes are helping anti-ISIS, anti-ISIS operation in Iraq. But again, there are two things. Uh, the southern flank is, exists again. So the southern flank is, uh, is is part today of the overall NATO picture. After 1980s, the southern flank did not exist anymore, as USSR didn't exist anymore. There was no threat anymore. Now, the Syrian case offers, let's say, a, a, a new life to this kind of vision. Because if you see, if you if you look at Russia from a geopolitical point of view or geostrategical. First, you take Crimea and you ensure that you have this access to the Black Sea, also knowing that Crimea is a very important military naval base for, the, for, the, for Russia. And then you move to Syria, where you deploy, you save the Syrian regime, and you deploy forces and base in Tartus and Latakia, which now are again to uh, good uh, strongholds for Russia forces in Russia. It means that Russia now is again able to deploy its military force within the Mediterranean. It means that also it can deploy, for example, some ballistic missile capabilities within the Mediterranean area. So it might, it is for sure, it's not the type of capabilities we had in the Cold War, but it, it exists. And so again, NATO, as a collective defense organization, is seeing a threat, a potential threat from the south. And this potential threat is Russia. So this is, it is a, a rather, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not a strong speech of NATO, obviously. And obviously, NATO people are, 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 are diplomatic people. They don't want to say that too, too loud because they don't want to create a threat. Yeah. Nobody wants to, no one wants to push the Russians. 
too far. No, because everybody knows that they are hypersensitive, everybody knows they, know they are paranoiac, and they, they, uh, whatever. But it has to be taken in consideration, because it does exist, because there is deployment of troops in Syria. Obviously, the goal of, those, of this deployment now is to uh, sustain Bashar, to, 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 to show the, the capabilities there, and to show that they are an international actor which has to be taken into consideration. OK, this for sure has worked. I mean, this operation has been spending from Putin's side. But it also has this direct effect to create, again, a, a military threat on the south. Also because on the eastern north and eastern border, the military Russian threat is perceived as real again. Um, obviously, the, a country like Italy, for example, would be keen to relaunch uh, NATO partnership. NATO partnership in the Mediterranean area is called Mediterranean Dialogue or Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Those are the frameworks of engagement of countries, non-member of NATO, where you can develop securities, training, and things like that. It's a, it's a good way to make, uh, to make uh, diplomacy and, uh, and your goals progress. The problem is that the instability in this area and the instability of several countries make this effort for a moment a bit difficult. I mean, it's quite difficult now to have this integrated vision that once was. Uh, uh, and that's a problem because um, obviously terrorism has came as an issue. And terrorism is also an issue of destabilization of those countries. And uh, NATO has, until now, developed this kind of tool of stabilization partnership and would like and would be keen to, to, to apply those, those tools in those countries where you have a, uh, a regime which is quite OK, but you see the threats, you see extremism, you see some destabilization in some area, geographical area, and you would have to help them. But uh, it's, it's, the situation is so shaky that sometimes you can, you don't, you're not even able to develop those, those programs. Also, quite important, you know, but one of my last points. Uh, in Warsaw, there was a joint declaration between NATO and EU. Um, there is a clear will to strengthen uh, the, 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 the cooperation between NATO and the EU. Also, for example, on the operational maritime, maritime side. Um, on the EU side, and that will be my last, uh, my last development, uh, there is, I mean, a lot of things are happening on the EU side, but th this, this very intense activity might not result in such important uh, results. But again, I mean, today we are the 15th of uh, December, and there was today an, imp an, an important European Council uh, also uh, taking some decisions in terms of collective security and defense. What, what has happened? I mean, that we have to, 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 to remember that uh, the uh, high representative, uh, Federica Mogherini, has done a very interesting work. For example, the first step has been uh, this year to uh, define and propose a uh, 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 European Union global security strategy which means a vision of the needs and the threats of security in Europe. For sure, this vision, this EUGS, as we call it, European Union Global Security Strategy, the EUGS is a very holistic, a very comprehensive uh, document. And for sure, the Commission, as a civilian culture, as a democratic culture, and goes for comprehensive, integrative approach with a mix of security and development de diplomacy. This is typical from Commission. It's normal. So, and it's, and it's very, I mean, it has been very proactive. But this UGS has been then uh, developed 
And for example, one of the most interesting um, issues that we are following now is the so-called European Defence Action Plan. This European Defence Action Plan is uh, a capacity uh, plan, meaning that it, it goes for tools. It, 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 it makes the analysis that uh, the, 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 there are some shortfalls in Europe, some missing technologies, missing capabilities in the defense and in the security. And from the Commission side and from the EDA side, European Defense Agency, there is now a, a roadmap to uh, use some economical, financial, regulatory, and, and uh, uh, measures to enhance the level of cooperation and of capabilities on a new level. This, like always, is very technical, but it has clearly a vision. And there is, for the first time at the EU level, the need that the, 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 the clear perception that we need more. We need, we need more defense. Obviously, um, the European Commission cannot say, OK, we do something like a, a collective defense together, because it's not in the mandate of the European Union. I mean, defense is still strongly in the mandate of member states, of nations, if you want to say in, in an easy term. So the European Union does not have and cannot have until now a real uh, total mandate for defense. This is the reason why people who speak about ah, European defense, European army, just, OK, if they do that intellectually, that's fine. But you cannot speak about those things because it's not in, it cannot, cannot happen within the European institution now. Nevertheless, there is a growing awareness of the political priority of defense and security within the European institutions. And for example, if we use market tools, research, uh, pooling, uh, institutional building, I mean, some efforts can be done. And there is a very interesting work, which is now ongoing and has been discussed in the late months, uh, with uh, the, the, the Commission, Federica Mogherini Services, but also with the European Defence Agency, and also the main countries, like France, Germany, Italy and Spain, have been really pushing for some measures to, 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 to have real progress. So we are in a moment where Europe does, uh, does progress. I mean, the, 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 there is, there is a clear new institutional path, but it's not completely, uh, it's not what you can describe in a simplistic way as a unified integrated defense. On staying at the, on the same level, I mean, there is something going on. I mean, there might be in the next very near future what we call a, a PESCO, which means a, 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 a a special cooperation tool between willing countries in Europe. And this PESCO uh, might uh, leave on the side some countries that don't want to, 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 to pursue this path and accelerate the movement towards a more integrated defense in security. So to, to sum up what I'm, uh, I'm saying today, um, Mediterranean is again what you can call the NATO southern flank. Russia has stabilized its presence in Syria, and Mediterranean is not, Mediterranean area is not isolated. It's part of the strategic NATO problem. And Russian ballistic missiles are, for, for example, a threat coming from the east and coming from the south. So again, Mediterranean is back. In, his, in its uh, strategic definition. Mediterranean is also what it has been since 30 years, uh, an instability area in our neighborhood. It has been also uh, treated and dealt by NATO with security cooperation and, and crisis management. This uh, instability is one of the focus of the European 
uh, global strategy, of the EU, European Union global strategy. Uh, because the comprehensive approach that the EU is developing since uh, some years now is really uh, tailored to tackle those issues of stabilization and of instability. So, but this instability create threats which are not completely, at least, military, or sometimes are not military. Uh, you have stabilization, you might have immigration, but those, uh, this is more a police issue than a military issue, to some extent. So it's, it's a bit uh, tricky. Uh, also very interesting, the European global strategy uh, is developing a connection between the protection of the societies, and this is new in the European, in the European documents, the protection of the internal society, the necessity to protect our society, our democratic order, and the security projection outside the EU. Until now, the, the former, uh, the former uh, security document from the European Union uh, uh, had only the second part. You know, they had this vision of projecting the stability outside of the Union. Now, for the first time, we see that there is an awareness of the need to protect Meaning that this is a political shift, very interesting, because it creates a parallel with NATO. It creates a parallel with collective defense. It's different, it's clearly different. They don't mix their approaches, but they are, they are, they, 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 there is. And that, this also is leading to a a new framework of cooperation between NATO and the EU. This is something which is coming from the recent NATO summit. This is also something which is coming from the several steps that are now taken into, uh, taken into developments and, uh, uh, by the European Union, uh, the need to collaborate with NATO. And the f there is now this very interesting idea that if the EU uh, is able to uh, develop and foster its capabilities in terms of security and defense, it will also help the NATO. First of all, because the EU has a civilian comprehensive security approach uh, that NATO and know-how that NATO cannot have because uh, EU is very good in terms of civilians, uh, of, uh, of uh, development, aid, trade, uh, diplomacy, I mean, this mix of things. On the, on the other hand, NATO remains the defense organization with all the procedures and, 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 and standards to deploy and perform real defense uh, e operation. And there was, from, from a, for a long period, there was some differences between those two approaches. I mean, it, it, it was parallel, but it, couldn't, it wouldn't come across. Now, there is a dialogue. And again, I, I, I mean, it's not, it's not because that Federica Mogherini was once uh, an, an EI board member, but I think that she is doing a, a really good job in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, creating uh, these kind of bridges. I mean, it's becoming more and more uh, a trend. Also, I mean, Brexit on this side obviously maybe can help because Brits were the NATO guy and the one who will say, okay, we do everything through NATO and EU shall not at all step into this kind of dossier. This vision has its logic, but it would impede any kind of cooperation framework. It was more, for me, it was more a problem than a real, uh, than a real solution. Now that, I mean, UK is the UK, is still a member of the European Union, it's not out for sure, but politically the, 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 the UK referendum has, uh, has affected the UK position. So now, I mean, the other countries, uh, they, they, they feel that they are free to move on, and that's what they are doing. So they are moving on in the Europe, and it's also a, a, a source of development for, for NATO. Um, again, last, last ideas that I would be happy to develop. Is the Mediterranean category a good one? 
is it relevant for the debate? I'm, might not be so sure. I mean, Middle East and uh, North Africa, MENA countries, uh, seems more and more to be a geographic uh, definition of what can be the threats or what is the, the, the need, the, the, area, the, the area that needs some stabilization. Uh, Sahara and Sahel is also an area of concern, as well as the Horn of Africa. Just to say that maybe Africa, and we are seeing that also at the European level, Africa is becoming more and more the, the word to describe the reality of instability. Because if you take into consideration the problem in the South, OK, we have the Middle East, and it has its dynamics, but the South is deep. What do, do I mean when the South is deep? I mean, when you deal, for example, with Libya, when you deal with Libya, OK, Libya, it's not something, it's small, Libya. It's a few people on the shore. But then you know better than I do that Libya is a, is a gate. It's a gate to, to Sahel, to Sahara, and to Africa. It means that there is this awareness now that these problems uh, need to be taken in their complexity and Africa also with the popping up of terrorism, destabilization, mix of uh, integralism, uh, economic problems, the fact that you know, the, the thing that French have been uh, uh, struggling for in Mali and then after in the Balkan operation. Keep in mind also that the US have created a US African command to, to provide military action and assistance in Africa in, to, to some countries, and they are working closely with French. I mean, there are now there is there is a, a, a strong awareness about about Africa as a problem that shall be treated, and for sure, very often what Italian called Mediterranean uh, might sound not precise enough uh, to to people who want to really deal and create really create alliances. To, for, 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 uh, to tackle those issues because, for sure, in Africa we need to apply comprehensive approach with a mix of defense, yes, but civilian security, uh, building up of institutions, economical development, uh, cooperation, uh, access to culture, uh, internet deployment, uh, technological vision, I mean, I'm, I'm, you can, I, I can go on like that. Again, uh, the Middle East is, is, uh, is uh, a region that had, is dynamic and can be observed, uh, meaning that uh, the Mediterranean is, 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 a, is, a, is a sea, for sure, and this sea receives those indirect threats or those direct threats. I mean, and migration, you are obviously well prepared to analyze this phenomena is maybe the most important uh, example of these side effects. But uh, for sure there is a strong politics towards immigration, emergency, and it's a, it's a huge political effort, and it's a huge political for, effort from Italy. But if we want to, to have a, a security vision uh, the security vision needs to, to, uh, to have a more global approach. And the more global approach might be uh, better understood by a lot of countries, a lot of institutions, if we speak about Africa, or at least Middle East and North Africa, uh, Middle East on the side. I mean, where now you really have, I mean, the, 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 this mix of destabilization, of deployment of Russia, of new powers emerging, and I'm, I'm leaving on the side the different you know, regional Middle East problems from Iran and then Saudi Arabia and whatever. And, and also, I mean, this very complex African scenario with also a mix of destabilization, but also modernity, demography, economics, and, and calls, uh, calls to, 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 to for us some 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 some, uh, some political and, and intellectual thinking. 
because we cannot be only passive, meaning not being passive means, okay, we, we, we cannot think only in terms of offense to protect ourselves. But we really have to address the issue. Address the issue not only in a very, I would say, uh, rapid way, thinking that, oh yeah, well, uh, people in, 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 in Central Africa are so poor, and you have civil wars, and they escape, and they come to Europe, and if we help them to stabilize, uh, it, it will cease. Might not be even the truth, this kind of logic. I mean, for sure it exists. But again, we, we, we have for sure uh, 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 a real interest to, 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 to define a common way, common European, but common also way with Africa in, uh, in, in the stabilization in the, and in promoting some order uh, which can, uh, can be more uh, interesting in terms of uh, well-being of people and eventually of democracy. But I'm going too far. So that was the last few words just to be a bit, you know, um, I would say provocative. I know that I'm speaking within a, a Mediterranean uh, course, but obviously, as I'm French, and now with all, with all well, this little pro culture of provoca uh, to, to provoke people, I wanted to finish in this kind of issue that we might have to reconsider the Mediterranean category as a category of thinking to tackle the issues. But again, that's just food for thought. I will stop now. I, I, will, I think I've Maybe I've been a bit too long, I don't know. But please ask me if you want some, some details or not, or if you want to say you're not against, you're not, uh, you're not, uh, you don't agree with what I said. I'm more than happy to discuss with you. Thank you.